and welcome to episode 84 of our SAP on Azure video podcast. Today is March 17th and together with Goran and Robert, we're here to talk about anything related to SAP and Microsoft. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. So today we have our good friend Ralph back on the call. Last year, Ralph shared with us some fantastic deep dive sessions on Azure NetApp files. Um, today, he will not only talk about um, Kerberos authentication with Azure NetApp files, but we might also get some recipes from him. <laughs> again, but again. <laughs> that, that's called a bonus part. A bonus part. Bonus. But before we go to the bonus part and also um, Kerberos, let's What's take a look at some of the news from, from this week. And I want to start um, with a new entry um, on docs.microsoft.com where we talk about um, integrating Azure services with SAP RISE. Um, so we see a lot of customers um, currently obviously um, going to RISE, RISE with SAP um, and selecting Azure as the underlying infrastructure platform. And then there are very often these questions, well, look, I, I have so many other services running on Azure. I have some other workload already deployed on, on Azure, on my, on the customer's Azure subscription. How can I connect from my um, Azure subscription into the SAP Rise on Azure subscription? And in this um, article that was created by um, Robert Biro. Um, Robert basically guides us through a lot of different options. What can we do with um, network peering? What different kinds of um, VNet peerings are available? How can we connect to an on-premises um, system? How do we um, use the concept of VVAN, of, of virtual VANs? What about um, DNS configuration? So it's a really nice um, overview of what are the, the possibilities of how I can connect my, yeah, my, my own Azure subscription with the rise on SAP Azure subscription. Um, actually, th this is th the starting point. We we already are here, for example, at BTP, but, but um, we have a, several other things that we're already working on. So, so we'll definitely also extend um, this, this article, but I think it's a great start if you are going with rise on SAP, um, that you are <laughs> SAP rise on Azure. On, yeah, that, that um, how you can actually connect this um, with your own Azure subscription. Okay, the next um, article, um, Goran, you also brought this up um, just now again from <clears throat> Robert Biro um, about um, using SAP virtual host names with Azure, with Linux on with Azure. Linux, yeah, <clears throat> yeah we, we had actually, there is a link to the Windows part, Windows blog actually from a colleague of mine who did it, yes. So this this is a Linux version, a Linux version. So um, <clears throat> yeah, first came the Windows and then uh, the Robert again. First wrote came about, Windows, then came Linux. <laughs> well, that's, that's a nice, uh, nice sentence. <laughs> 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 Not everybody would agree, but anyway, what is interesting for me, it's um, the point when I was working in the support in the past and people were asking for virtual host name and uh, again, we should know it's not a clustering here. In clustering, mm -hmm. you would always have virtual host name. Saplama can move the virtual uh, instance from host to host, meaning having a virtual host name makes sense, but here customers would do it uh, <clears throat> just like that on, on a standalone VM, you know, install it application server or maybe standalone central services. So I ask why, you know, why, why do you complicate your life, you know? And the answer was interesting because the, the folks said, we, they have a security policy which includes that host name should have a certain longer length. Mm -hmm. Now with SAP, you have no choice. You know, the maximum length uh, is 13 mm -hmm. characters because of those multi operating system support. So, okay, 13 is the biggest number on some operating system. So they have no choice. On the other hand, they do have a choice and want to use those longer names on the operating system, local host name, as well on the VM. And then immediately you have two host name, local host name and the virtual host name. So, mm -hmm. so that was an interesting argument why somebody would love to use, for example, virtual host name in Geno, you know. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, the Robert did a nice job and he's just telling about adding those additional IP addresses on the same NIC card 
and also bounding the DNS entries and, and then how you do it step by step. So very nice blog. OK, he put it even in multiple nicks. All right, OK. All right, cool. so just warmly welcome people to check it. Perfect. Hey, um, move on. Oh, so this was the one from from the last Windows year around part, um, yeah. Windows. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Then um, moving on, I think we, we talked about this or you talked about this already last week or the week before that there was now um, a new SAP node um, talking about support for Windows Server 2022. And in this blog post or in this um, tech community article from um, Carmen, um, Cameron, sorry, um, he, he talks about this in, in more detail. So what does it actually mean? What are the supported um, NetWeaver releases? What um, the supported databases? What can you run? Um, he talks about kernels. So, so this is basically, I would say, an, um, a deep dive into the um, SAP node. What does it actually mean um, now that um, Windows Server 2022 is supported? Um, and, and just a, a nice collection of, of resources um, that I can reference to if I'm um, um, now migrating or, or updating to Windows Server 2022. Um, the next one is around Microsoft Sentinel. Um, so remember, we, we had um, the session with um, Joao. Um, uh, uh, nah, Aaron and another colleague. Uh, I just had the name, but I forgot. Um, and they and they talked about um, Microsoft um, Sentinel. Um, and in in this article here, Naomi um, continues the story basically, and and she says, look. Um, with um, the SOAR capabilities, so the um, security operations and automation response um, functionalities of Microsoft Sentinel, what I can do is I, I can detect this the signals um, um, on my SAP system, and then I can also take actions on this. So, so basically, in this in this use case, they're they're talking about um, um, yeah blocking an SAP user after some suspicious um, incidents and. Um, what they are doing, so so obviously Sentinel is, is, is connected. I, I have the appropriate run books configured. And then what I can do is I can um, trigger, for example, an, an logic app flow. So um, where the trigger is really this Microsoft Sentinel incident. And then I'm using um, the ERP connector from logic apps to, for example, really block this specific user so that then um, after the sub suspicious activities were detected, the user is is locked, and then um, yeah, uh, there there needs to be an action. So I think this is a nice um, combination of the the insights that we now get um, via Microsoft Sentinel, and what we can do with this information. Again, a very very simple use case, and you could certainly extend this and and, and create something on top. But I think it's a nice um, scenario how you can use these these triggers, these um, informations together um, with Logic Apps. Yeah. And, and a nice integration example and uh, flexibility that we have it in Azure to extend it. Absolutely, yeah. Um, then the next one is um, Azure Purview. So uh, mm -hmm. remember, Purview is really about um, data governance um, to see wh where the data is coming from, to look at the lineage of, of the information. And now um, Purview is also supporting SAP Business Warehouse. So basically what this means is if you, if you go here to Azure Purview, um, and if you um, look at the, the the data sources that you can connect to, now you can not only connect to S4HANA, to your ECC, but also um, to a BW system. So basically it allows you to really um, look at the um, the data in your um, your BW system and then use this information, the metadata of this um, of your BW system to also incorporate this into, into Purview and really have this um yeah and, and include it basically in your governance process the last thing so last week we started with martin this week we we are ending with martin <laughs> martin pankratz has um, um released another um blog post um together with will isbury so um he was also on the show um last week in this new blog post which i find extremely exciting um He's talking about how to consume an you know, data service um, and specifically in this scenario um, with the Power Platform, although the Power Platform currently does not support natively OData. So the idea is that you take the OData service and um, you use um, a converter basically. So um, there's um, an, an open source project available 
um, that you can run, but actually Martin and Will, they created a web-based um, converter, so you can use um, the OData service, the, the OData metadata information, convert this information into an open API specification. And now this open API specification could be imported in Power Automate, but actually what they're doing is they're importing this first in Azure API management. So in Azure API management, um, they can leverage um, throttling, quota handling, uh, generic um, protection functionalities, and actually, and that's the even cooler thing, they can also do principal propagation. So they, they can, for example, prepare for receiving um, an access token from Azure Active Directory, doing a, the, the whole conversion that, that, that we um, also heard about from, from Martin Repple um, several times ago. So we can take the Azure Active Directory token, convert it into a token that is also accepted, um, in this case, by an SAP gateway system on-premise. And then we can really also have the single sign-on flow. That's for me a really, really powerful scenario because now you can very easily consume the OData service from your SAP gateway system in Power Automate um, and do the whole, um, and the, 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 the service is protected by Azure API management and you get the benefits of, um, of a, a single sign-on scenario. And as always, um, Martin really outlines this in, in a very detailed um, steps, what you need to do. So how do I convert actually my OData service into the open API specification? Actually in this tool, they're really making sure that you get the right properties and the right structure so that it can be read and imported by Azure API management, that it can, can, can then also be used by, um, by the Power Platform. Um, once it is in, in API management, what do you need to do there? How do you then publish um, the resulting API management service into the Power Platform. So how do you create um, a, a connector on the Power Automate side? And then um, in the end, um, he shows how you can actually consume the service then um, directly from Power Automate. So I think actually this is, this is really, um, this is something that is super important. It, it provides you with all the flexibility to have a single sign-on flow. It really allows you to protect your OData service in the SAP system from unwanted load from, from um, peaks in, in, the, um, in, in the access to the SAP system. It's, it's a really fantastic blog post. And I, I'm sure this will be something um, that a lot of customers will use when, when connecting their power platform into an SAP system. Okay, so with this, again, for me, big highlight of, of this week, um, let me, um, stop my screen sharing and um, Ralf, over to you. I mean, I I would assume that most of the, our audiences know you, but maybe you can still start with a quick introduction. What do you do at Microsoft? And then I'm looking forward to what to cook next week and Here also what I can do with Azure NetApp files and Kerberos authentication. Yeah, talking about highlights. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation again. So I'm very happy again to say some words to the audience here. Uh, yeah, my name is Ralf Klar. I'm working in the Azure Core, uh, only concentrated on SAP workloads, uh, mainly uh, on Azure Native Files at the moment. Yeah, so that really keeps me busy in in all directions. So in uh, supporting customers for larger migrations and new developments and so on and so on and so on. So there are a lot of uh, stuff what um, is on my plate at the moment. Yeah, and therefore uh, we picked now the topic which was requested from many customers to enable Kerberos. And Kerberos not so much for the, um, that, at least the, the initial intent was also to see how the encryption in transit for the data would be from the server to the storage. Uh, but you will also see during uh, the presentation, which you will see in a few seconds, that um, that part actually was killed because of the performance impact that encryption would have. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, the performance goes down. Let's say if you have a 120 megabyte um, possibility of workload with what your baseline is, yeah, then you go down until 25 megabytes for throughput, and that will kill your database performance. Yeah. So, therefore, um, and that cap was uh, 5P, how it's called, um, will definitely not work for database workloads. But still, for example, if you know this and you would still require, for, for example, for your transport directories, <laughs> um, or for your interface directories where you say, I have that high demand on, on, on security. I need an encryption between 
uh, if all, or let's say only for my, my, my transit files, then that would be an option, of course. But for database files, for database and log files, this is totally impossible to, to use simply because of the, the, the bandwidth penalty you would take. Nevertheless, before we talk all about this boring stuff, I would share would think I share first the important stuff. Because mm -hmm. I was invited when I was in February in Spain, I was invited from my neighbor and uh, she and her husband uh, were cooking this dish for me this evening. And honestly, that was amazing. That was so good that after I had it at her house, I cooked it two times for myself in Spain for my friends, which were visiting me. And let me tell you, that was also amazing. So, um, now it takes a few seconds. One second. Yeah. It's coming up. It's coming up. <laughs> there is. There you go. Fish. There. And, and that really is. And it, it, it really looks also as nice as what you see here. Mm -hmm. And let me go into the presentation mode. Then it's maybe a little bit nicer. And uh, we do not spend too much time here. And for people who do not like cooking, they can forward uh, yes. the next <laughs> two minutes because I usually I, I do not need more than two minutes. Eh? So and that fish uh, stew is very easy to make. Let's say if you like cooking, easy to make. So you need a lot of ingredients. I, 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 I mentioned this all on the left side. So you need uh, some prawns and um, many customers they don't like to peel the prawns but you need the head for the soup and also then it's easier to eat if you peel the the, the prawns completely so that is what i do so i um when, when i make this i peel the prawns put the heads aside because i use this for the soup and yeah, then you need some squids some codfish or monkfish you <laughs> cut this in in cubes and then a lot of vegetables and some tomato so uh, tomato uh, puree so it can usually you take a can for this because it's uh, nice Sour cream, white wine, which is very important. You take another special one, uh, only what you have opened when you cook. You can use this wine also then for your for your dish. And basically, you cut everything uh, in small pieces. And um, I have also a little call for action here, how you make it then. And honestly, that is a very, very nice dish. So if you like fish, if you like cooking, go through all the steps. And if you do not, uh, if you would need any information please of course be so free and uh, connect me directly because that i think is um, is something very nice if you, you never invited us for dinner actually yeah, that just in, uh, to spain to my house in spain you mean yeah yeah uh, i don't care. yes <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah um yeah let's see but that is something we definitely have to do a cooking session next time live with live oh, webcams yeah. or so something yeah. uh, with more action Yes. Sounds and good. Next Episode challenge. Right. <laughs> yeah. The next time, the Mediterranean vegeta vegetarian meal. Yeah, here we go. So I'm, I am. If you know me, I'm absolutely open for those things. Excellent. Yeah, and uh, let me just try to find my mouse here, which is uh, is coming. Uh, I guess I would need a pen. Usually, I need a pen for those. Uh, pointers in my laser pen. All right. So yeah, today topic. So the main topic where I was invited for was not the soup. It was the Carbos authentication with Azure Network Files for SAP workloads. And uh, before we go into the details, and I also will show how that works in detail. So I have um, logged into my server, and if we still have some time left, I will also show how that works um, in in practice. Um. Term definition. I think this is very important because many people are not so familiar with uh, what is happening um, with Kerberos. So you uh, have a key distribution center that is basically uh, a system which has two tasks. Yeah. So it uh, contains for the authentication server and the ticket granting service. Yeah. And that works in the way that the client logs into the authentication servers server with his ID. And then the authentication server checks with the Azure Active Directory if that user is allowed, for example, to mount a file system. And then if it is registered in Azure, direct, uh, Azure Directory, then that authentication server sends the information back to the ticket granting server. And then the, the client gets the, the ticket. And with this ticket, the client is allowed to mount or access the, um, the, the volume. And here, this is what um, where we need to see the, the, the three, let's say, Kerberos flavors. Yeah, that Kerberos 5 
Yeah, that means that the client has only connection to that authentication server, which I described that way, and then get the ticket and mount the file system. That is a simple way of uh, Kerberos uh, interaction with uh, with uh, with Azure. Then the the next uh, higher level is the Kerberos 5i, and with Kerberos 5i, every IP package um, will also get a um, a hash. Uh, an MD5 checksum on that on that on that on that IP package, and that, for example, um, saves or let's say makes sure that there's no data tampering on the way from the server to the to the storage. Yeah, so uh, that prevents the data temper uh, tampering because then they, we would get it allowed, and that package would be um, yeah uh, would be not accepted from the uh, from the from the server. Uh, and one then, question. Uh, yes, sure. I, I still have the term definition slides. Are you? Uh, maybe... Term definition slides. This is what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah, we're still okay. about okay. here the authentication server okay. and the ticket granted server. Okay. And you will see it in a few more slides. Uh, uh, the entire story, but just okay. uh, for the um, for the uh, for the yeah some some factors. As I said, Kerberos five. 5i and 5p and 5p you really have the um you have the um encryption on the wire uh, and that uh, as i said if you see here the the example uh, when you have a baseline of 120 megabyte that goes down to 23 mm -hmm. 24 megabytes with Kerberos 5p and for database loads that would not be um, that would not make any sense i have a link here in the present presentation that uh, unfortunately is only in Germany uh, and German language uh, written. But um, yeah, if you're aware of German, then of course that makes sense. Okay, but that is uh, that is the reason why we say, hey, um, um, let's say you can use Kerberos five and five i. Uh, that is, let's say, I would tolerate this in terms of performance. But with five p, that is um, too much, too difficult, not acceptable, yeah. too yeah. much away. <clears throat> Ralf, uh, very briefly, um, I mean, we, we talked um, uh, in in the past very much about when, when we talk about authentication, when we talk about um, single sign on, we, we very often talk uh, are talking now about SAML authentication, about OAuth authentication and so on. But I think for um, intranets and, and for, for scenarios like this, um, Kerberos is still um, the, 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 the protocol that makes most sense, right? I, I mean, I think I think so too. Yeah, I think so too. And that is at least also supported uh, in Azure for Azure mm -hmm. Data here. So you can create uh, that story. Yeah, and mm -hmm. um, that, yeah. I mean, okay. I, I still remember like um, when we in the very early days of Duet, when, when we when we looked at the integration of SAP and Microsoft, where we had the first integration in Outlook and so on. Um, mm -hmm. Then there was one time when SAP came up with supporting Kerberos or more specific mm -hmm. SPNego for the authentication. And that's where um, I got in contact with Kerberos for the very first time. And um, it worked perfectly once you had set it up um, in your domain, in your intranet. But for example, one shortcoming always then was when you want to do this across companies, across uh, fr from outside or something like that. That's where we always had issues with Kerberos. And I think that's where then also the whole browser-based SAML authentication, the OAuth authentication came in and, and really said, look, um, Kerberos is nice, but, but mainly for the um, for the um, in-domain, in your company, in, 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 the, uh, in your own environment, basically. And I think that's where, where this still makes a lot of sense, like um, in the scenario here with Azure NetApp Files. Correct, and you see also this. What I describe here is really the the, the infrastructure security, so to say. Mm -hmm. yeah? So mm -hmm. not authentication where you uh, let's say try as a user yep. a service or a, a function, but this is really infrastructure security. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that table you have. I use a, a an open source tool called Tana Stress. To this is a tool where you can very easily. It's from GitHub. You can download this from GitHub. Um, you can easily, let's say, create in this sense uh, uh, 10,000 tables and load every table with 20,000 rows that you have some HANA interaction. And since um, I, especially for this, look into write operation, that mm -hmm. tool is pretty easily um, and pretty nicely use, uh, usable for this. And um, that table, the lower is better. Yeah? So that means um, for this 10,000 tables with each 20,000 entries in each table took here 30 minutes and 24 seconds with native. Yeah, with Kerberos 5, it went up uh, almost to, to 15 minutes. 
and with 5i, it went up to almost 17 minutes yeah, for the, the du duration of those import of those tables. Um, and probably with, with, um, with ERP workload, this scenario gets even worse yeah, in terms of when you, when you use Kerberos 5i. Yeah, because and every, imagine that every IP package gets also a hash mark uh, on, on top of it. And that really can cost uh, massive performance. And uh, let's say this Kerberos 5p, uh, where you have also the encryption on the wire, then the, the table would be uh, kind of here and maybe higher. Okay. That was my test setup, what I had. So I had a um, little virtual machine here. I uh, created um, a service because I thought uh, it is nice to also demonstrate how that um, Azure Direct, uh, Active Directory domain service would work in that scenario. So, and that is only a service-based uh, domain service and uh, and also and that is also able to um, to to deliver our Kerberos functionality, and of course I have our Azure AD, and I did the combination, the, the uh, coupling between the Azure AD and my Azure ADDS servers, I had a jump box and my Azure Network files, and here I had two volumes, one volume was with Kerberos configured, and the nice. other one was without on the same IP address, so that was easy then for testing that I also compare apples to apples here. Cool. So, yeah. Questions? No, no, sorry, go ahead, yeah. All right, so, and how does it work now? Um, as, I, as I mentioned, when I have here my client, and my client uh, would like to mount a file system from my Azure Network files, then my client goes into, do, must first have a domain login, and then the client requests a ticket. The uh, Azure Active Directory domain service, where I have my uh, key distribution center uh, uh, configured, that will uh, will look into the user of that uh, that server. Is that user mentioned in that Azure directory? If it is mentioned, he will provide me that the the, the ticket, and I also uh, and then I'm able to mount the, um, the the volume. And of course, also the ANF validates the ticket from my uh, key distribution center. That also ANF knows about this because that ANF is coupled to the Azure di uh, directory, yeah, to my domain service here, and that validates the ticket if everything is okay. And only when the validation has taken place, then I can mount the volume. Mm -hmm. That is basically um, how that works. And this also takes a little time, and that was that is the thing why, and then also the performance is a little bit is a little bit less. So for the Linux authentication, um, as you all know, of course, the Azure Active Directory domain service is immutable here in terms of the um, on the Active Domain or LDAP structure, which gets imported from the Azure Active Directory. Therefore, because you need to map the user IDs and the group IDs for your um, for for the um, ANF connect, therefore I created here another operational unit, another OU. Um, I was um, uh, I made it easy and I named it SAP. <laughs> and in that in that operational unit in that OU, I created here my user in ADM and my SAP group subsys. This and that's all gets also pointed to the Azure Active Directory because and to the ANF and um, because ANF will validate the the user and um, the group once the operating system user would like to try and to mount the data volume. And that is what we also will see in the demonstration a little bit later on. So you must have a connection <clears throat> from your Azure NetApp files to your Active Directory and you must specify the user like they are on the operating system. <clears throat> Ralph, just one quick question. Operating system, what you, I think, described in the blog and tested was based, it's Linux based, and also you use those HANA stuff, HANA <clears throat> performance tools to test the performance. Yes. You also wrote some blog on Oracle, on ANF, on Windows. So a question is, can the operating system here also be a Windows, or is this tested? Now, Windows was not tested, but you can uh, use an Oracle database, for example, for the same scenario, or an in, uh, in, uh, AZ. That Oracle on well. Linux. So it's, not, it's not HANA related here. This mm. um, would work with uh, any other database as well. Yeah, yeah, but on Linux. 
Or Linux. I, I only use Linux for this uh, combination. Okay. But I guess it should also work on Windows, right? I mean, um, <clears throat> then I you have SMB volumes here. Uh, technically, it, it should work also on Windows, but I haven't tested it. So um, yeah. difficult yeah. to say yes here in this. Uh, <laughs> so therefore, with Linux, it's absolutely working 100% nicely. Okay. Um, to enable those features, yeah, we need some some uh, very new features from Azure Native Files, which are in uh, I think they are in public preview at the moment. Yeah, because we need some especially that uh, LDAP extension groups that those, those functionality, and we absolutely require to make sure that also the SAP user is able to access um, the 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 volumes. Otherwise, root can access the volume. Yeah, but if you have a user which would like to access the content on this volume, which I also demonstrate later on, then um, that would not be possible. So that took me also some time to figure that out. Uh, after I, I've uh, implemented and, and configured this um, this LDAP extension, uh, then it worked nicely. So it's also described and also uh, wrote uh, in a tech article. Um, in our tech community, uh, where I have really a detailed end-to-end -end description how this what must be configured. Yeah, the volume creation on ANF now looks a little bit different because of those new features. For example, we get here the uh, the LDAP connect, we get a Linux group permission, and we get here uh, an additional field that read write Kerberos um, action that comes with all the new features. And especially very important here, LDAP must enable the LDAP functionality. Otherwise, ANF is not able to uh, retrieve the, the settings from the Azure Active Directory. I only get these these properties once I have done the Enable AZ feature free, registration. Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, okay. the features, yeah. You need to mm -hmm. enable them. And it can take a while. It can take an hour until those features. If you okay. register them, make sure that you um, do the list namespace and you check if all the, those features are enabled. Okay. Because yep. the enabling of those uh, the enabling of those features can take, yeah, maybe an hour. I, at least I waited uh, for some time until those features got active. Understood. Okay, and then these properties would show up in in the portal, and I can define them here. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. Ex ex exactly right. Yeah. Then you need to uh, to to add some 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 new RPMs uh, in your uh, system. To be able to to make all those uh, the usage, for example, the, the real management, yeah, that you are able to to mount your or to connect to your domain, yeah, the Linux server must also be a part of the domain then. Um, but I show this, and very important is Crony or the NTP service that if this is also not configured correctly, then mm -hmm. this Kerberos also doesn't work because of the timing. You get tickets and certificates only on on in a, for a certain time, and therefore that uh, Crony uh, NTP service must be definitely enabled and working. Yeah, when you, uh, for example, join the domain to this um, to this, um, yeah, when you do the domain join for the Linux server, yeah, you have a new command that realm join. This is my domain. That is my user, and that is my. A location where um, where this gets stored, mm -hmm. and um, that domain join will then take place here in the upper part mm -hmm. of the active, active uh, Azure Active Directory domain service. And here you see all those VMs as well. Here your Linux VM. After you enable this command, then um, you this uh, VM shows up here. And the next step. You need to configure your Kerberos 5 um, uh, um, config file, and here play very close attention that you have capital capital letters ah, here I'm... for your um, for the domain, and also you need to figure out what your master KDC is and uh, your admin server. This is of course visible then in in Azure when in the portal when you go to your direct the directory service which you install then you see also the 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 yeah the fully full, fully qualified domain name for your uh, for the server and for also the the KDC. And once you have configured this all correctly, then the next step is you log in from your Linux server into um. Uh, into the, the the key distribution center and retrieve a key. 
Once you have the, the key, you need to restart the NFS uh, services and the RPC service, and then you can work on your system. And another thing what is important that ID map daemon, and uh, when you use Azure Network files, here usually you have uh, the default uh, uh, default domain uh, mentioned. And here, of course, you should also now set in your domain where the client is logged into. So it's not that default for uh, uh, Azure.com domain, it's subcontrosa.com here, in my case. And then you uh, specify your FS tab. You can mount your volume. And all this, no. I think, makes sense to, um, yeah, also uh, show now on the live system. But Ralph, while you switch to the live system, I mean, you 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 just said, well, if you configured everything correctly, yeah. then, then it works. <laughs> I, I still remember we had a lot of issues always yes. setting up yes. Kerberos. Um, yes. We had actually um, troubleshooting tools that, that helped you to identify the issues. We had um, a lot of... Um, Wireshark um, traces done to to figure out what went wrong and and so on. So yeah. uh, an honest answer: How long did it take you to to set this up? I mean, now oh. I think we have to, you have the documentation, so it's much much easier to follow. Now but it's I would easier. still expect. It, it took me it took me really uh, easily three weeks a little bit more until yeah. I had all figured out because this was completely a new topic. Yeah, yeah, that was a very new topic, and, and it was described in many slides of Dr. Microsoft and how you configure cameras on Azure Net Files, but not that for that SAP part. And suddenly the user did, uh, was not able to log in, and in and, and all those little nifty details. Uh, but therefore, here maybe I let me let me show this here, um, if I may. Yes, come on. My friend, it's coming. That was exactly the reason why I wrote this um, article here. <clears throat> the tech community blog. Here we go. And in that, I guess you can see it now, eh, that yes, in that yep. uh, implementing Azure files with Kerberos, this is a really detailed description how you do and how you need to do this and what you need to click and which uh it is pretty uh pretty detailed fantastic yeah 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 so and, and with this i hope that uh, at least for our customers um that gets uh, much easier than uh, than it was for me excellent perfect yeah so, so now let's and, show us yeah show us show me not only talking about show me and uh, um yeah, so as you see, um, this is my SAP oh, HANA can you system. Try to make it a little bigger. It's yeah, um, yeah, really of hard. All. Of, I thought I already made it bigger, but I think it's maybe, uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, make the letter types a little bit bigger. Uh, the appearance change, make it 20 or 18, 20, so maybe. Is it? Better? Yeah, I think that's better. Yes. Better. Otherwise, they make this a little bit larger here. Oh, yeah, this. Okay, ah, perfect. So. Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, um, as I said, we have two volumes. And in that FS tab, uh, they are marked uh, here by HANA data and my HANA log. And I use Kerberos 5i. When I now say mount, volume i get a very uh, nice message mount incorrect mount option was specified why is that because i do not have a valid key and therefore let me simply do the the easy the easy way here i uh log into my uh, at least i request a new key mm -hmm. give a password Now I have a key, K list shows me the key. One second, ah, moment, one second. Make this a little bit smaller. So I think this is still okay. Yeah, so that is my key. I just got a new key. And now, after I got the key, as I mentioned, I need to restart the two services here. 
which I do. And let me try exactly the same command. It's mounted. Is that nice? So and also now, since I have now the valid key, I also can do the mount of slash honor slash lock slash ANA slash MNT. Well, so now I have after I got the 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 the, the valid key. Now I can mount um, my file systems. You I see those two file systems also here um, in. Uh, in the directory, in the, in the overview, df minus h, but now the stuff happens. Now, su minus a and a, adm. If I now the SAP user and try to say, uh, touch hmm? people, uh, he has expired. He has expired okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now that friend also, as I mentioned, we have talked about security here. For those who like security, I also need a valid key for that user to be able to write into that directory, which I already have mounted. Mm -hmm. And now I have the valid key. But. Uh, cool. But, but so that what a... would now happen if the key expires? Um, I think the, the key is valid for a day or something like that. It's for a day, but for the SAP user, it does not make uh, any difference because he already has some open files. When you start HANA, for example, when you have mm -hmm. when you start HANA, then you have open files and mm -hmm. that will uh, continue running. Cool. So yeah, I just would... need to request the key. For example, before the startup, I would in implement this in my in my startup script. Then correct, I get correct. the key, and yes. then um, because I have these open files, the, the key is refreshed, I guess, correct, um, correct. automatically, and I continue to have access. Cool. Ex exactly right. Exactly right. But now, after you have all the keys, but is that, that is the additional level of security that, uh, but, but also to remember with Azure Network Files, we have this export policies we talked about in the first session uh, half a year ago. Now, with that export policy, you can specify a single IP address which is able and allowed to mount that um, that volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's, that's already a, a big, a very high bar you need to jump over when you try to do some some crazy stuff. But if the server has mounted now that volume without Kerberos, you still can have if a sneaky user tries to get in and tries to delete your data file, then he would be blocked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that, that therefore that is an additional level Ooh, of security, yeah. um, which Kerberos definitely delivers. But it costs really a lot of attention, um, and it is easy, much more difficult to manage than. Um, and the question is, if you, because Azure is already very secure, so do you really need this? So uh, usually I try to talk to customer and try to avoid this, um, this Kerberos setup because it's really a complex scenario and it costs you also performance. Yeah. <clears throat> Makes sense, yeah. Uh, this user, uh, CDADM, ANA ADM, uh, is this a local Linux user or it's an uh, Active Directory user? Both. Both. both can be both. It can, can be it actually it is both for for SAP when you do the installation. It always creates your uh, always creates your your um, the local user. Yeah, and and also and of course you can configure. Now I can could configure that you only when you do the login or the SU SU minus uh, ANA ADM, then that that gets retrieved from the Active Directory. That works as well. Okay. Yeah, that is here. You have this um, NS that switch to account, uh, account DTC NS switch dot conf. Here you define um, where your data is coming from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Group okay. password. So first LDAP and compat compatibility. So he looks first in LDAP and then uh, he looks um, in uh, and then we have the compatibility to more uh, more. Yeah. Yeah, so that is that is what um, what how I configured it. Cool, it looks great. And and I I think I mean the you you got customer requests for this, yes. right? Oh I yeah, mean... oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh yes, yes. Mm. 
even SAP asked about this for, uh, but they would like to have that encryption. And I guess, and hopefully I oh, can convince them that, uh, and really the encryption of Kerberos 5P uh, for databases is, um, yeah, not so much a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, because the performance, there will be in the future kernels where this is optimized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where the encryption is part of the Linux kernel in the end of the day, which will benefit absolutely um, in terms of performance. But I have to say we are not there yet. Yeah. Yeah. So at the moment, uh, as I said, it's easy, easy for <laughs> shared files for for, uh, for for all the files you can imagine, but not data files, not log files, not log backup files. All this uh, and log backup files. By the way, uh, did we? Um, I guess I also spent the th the fourth session on a local secure store versus. Uh, yes. Yes. We did this yep. already, and and this is in my point of view because the application is doing the encryption from SAP from SAP HANA in this sense. I think it's a much better way, without uh, with less performance impact, to use those local secure store, for example, those those. Um, encryption methods to to do this mm -hmm. so it doesn't sound so negative so Kerberos is working fine it's worked perfectly but if you said really talk about high performance databases uh, at least Kerberos 5p is not the right choice yeah. that must be clear and, uh, and we, sh we should be honest here that is i think uh, very very important yeah and plus some uh, oh administration overhead yeah administration so. overhead and if it's not working why it's not working and and no, this it's a complex configuration, as I mentioned, but it, it's doable. It is supported. As I said, not now a good guide. Data files, but um, for the rest, it is supported. We, we it is documented now uh, in the tech community. So therefore, it's possible. But I always try to convince customer using the SAP encryption over, let's say, the Kerberos encryption. Okay. <clears throat> Great. So I think that's some um, some good guidance. And if I yep. want to use it, then now I have a nice explanation how to do it. We saw it live. That's also yeah. great. Yeah, of course. Eh? Always live. Life is other without life, uh, it's boring. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Ralph, I think that's it for today. Um, um, a very crisp, a very good session. Thank you very so much. Fast, maybe too fast, of course, for the content. Uh, as I said, but uh, it should be a little bit quicker, I thought, and. No, it's good. It's it's perfect. It's perfect. And I mean, you can always pause the video. And yeah, the here we go. Order. Exactly. <laughs> Super. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ralf. Um, yeah, thanks we'll, for the we'll invitation. see you again. And, and I'm looking forward to this. Also for the next dish that we'll then see. Absolutely. <laughs> My pleasure. Great. Guys. Thank you. Have Thank a nice you. Bye, -bye. Bye, bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.